I became acquainted with him because one is a federal society's meeting, but also on the con law professor's listserv. He is normally arguing with everybody, including some of the conservatives. Uh, he is an expert on a variety of aspects of constitutional law. And if a few words about his view, you should ask him any questions, including some very esoteric ones like the one we just talked about before dinner, the letter, letter of reprisal. Letters of market reprisal. Letters of market reprisal. Mark M A R Q U E. Right. Yeah. Market reprisal. A part of the Constitution we do not cover. Anything else you want me to say? I can say the rest about myself. Great. <laughs> thank you for coming and thank you for staying. Well, good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I will say a few more little few more words about myself to, in order for you to understand where I'm coming from. By profession, I'm a computer scientist. My professional degree is in mathematics. I came to the Constitution starting as a small child when I read it, was enamored of it, and as time went on, I began to realize increasingly that our government officials were violating it. That bothered me a lot. But finally, when I went into the Air Force, I took an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. Now, I'm one who takes an oath seriously. Okay, I said that I've been studying this all my life up to now, but now I really need to know what it is that I'm committing to preserve, protect, and defend. And there was continuing tension for many years between government practice and the constitutional theory. Until finally, the massacre of the Davidians. I predicted that would happen. I knew the government well enough by then to know that they were going to kill them by fire. Standard operating procedure. Maybe I don't know who the Davidians are. At Waco, 1993. They were dead. Yeah. <laughs> there were 86 people who were killed at that event. It was murder. Ever, we all knew it was murder. Uh, even some agents themselves, in private, admitted it was murder. But they pretended it was all business as usual. Well, at that point, I knew there was going to be a movement to oppose this kind of abuse. So I decided it was time to get involved in a big way. So I organized on April the 1st, 1994, the Constitution Society and the Texas Militia Correspondence Committee. The modern militia movement is generally credited with having begun with my call up on that day. I call on militias to muster everywhere in the country on the morning of April 19, 1994 at 6 a.m. And a very large number of them did, including one I organized in Bear County in San Antonio. This was our way of telling the powers that be that we were not going to stand by while people are murdered in the name of the law. And you may have noticed that there has not been another Waco-like incident since then. The establishment was not at all prepared for the people to organize themselves as militia or to become fervent constitutionalists. When I got all this started, I was uh, almost alone, at least among better educated people, in my defense of the Constitution as originally understood. I was dismissed as fringe or scream or whatever. And of course they pointed out my 
involvement with the militia movement as, you know, could be used against me. But as time has gone on, more and more people have begun to adopt my positions on these subjects. And a lot of my scholar friends tell me that the, one of the main reasons is our website, constitution.org. We are now at more than a 150 million page views. It is cited by scholars, by lawyers, by all kinds of people. A lot of people turn to it first when they're doing research in this field. It is one of the top, most plagiarized sites by students. <laughs> I'm glad you just told about that about it now. <laughs> what I tried to do, in fact, it started out in a very simple way. I had read all this constitutional documentation, the things the founders wrote and read and were written about what they're thought by people who knew them. And it was simply inconvenient to have to keep going to the library whenever I wanted to look up a particular point. So it simply made more sense to get the books, scan them, and convert them into digital documents. And as long as I was doing that, I might as well put them on a website. And I figured, well, sooner or later, the government or some university or, you know, a lot of people are going to foundations are going to be putting all this stuff online. Well, they have, but they've never caught up. To this day, there is no other website that has as much stuff on the Constitution as Constitution.org. No matter how hard anyone seems to work at it, they can never catch up. Because I'm very productive. And I'm also very good at correcting mistakes. If you ever try to correct a mistake at the Library of Congress website, forget it. If you can even talk to a human being that tell you, well, we don't have a budget for corrections. <laughs> okay. But by the way, since that's right, I'm in awe. I, I do this because I like it part time. John studies the Constitution full time. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. Even <laughs> more than full time, really. Yeah. One of the best things I ever learned to do, and I, this is a little bit of a side, but I, it's worth emphasizing. When I was starting, when I was seven years old, I taught myself speed reading which is really speed learning. Most people learn only one way to read. They are not really taught how to read in public school. There are many different kinds of ways to read, not all of the facts, but having available speed reading as one of your options is really important. By the time I was nine, I was already reading more than a book a day. And I've never slowed down. Up to 20,000 words a minute. And that's with full comprehension, full retention. If you can learn how to do that, you will have a tremendous advantage in any field you try to go into. And it's not too late to start. I started out by ordering from through a magazine, a thing called a statistoscope which is basically a kind of a flash displayer of material on cards to try to train you to read faster and faster. Well, I found I could do the same thing by taking a four by six card, cutting a slot in it, and running it down a column of print, and just timing myself, going faster and faster and faster and faster, and testing myself on what I had read. So I only had to go over anything once. I trained myself to even think efficiently. I tried very hard to never think the same thought twice. To keep moving on and moving on, moving on. Don't go back and dwell over things over and over again. Just keep moving on, accumulating more and more insight, more and more depth, more and more analysis. Moving on and on and on, relentlessly. So, of course, I did that with constitutional materials. 
it is not really true that one can learn to understand the Constitution just by reading it and using ordinary English as we know it. It was not written in ordinary English. It's written in the legal English of 1787. And the people in 1787 did not believe in dictionaries. They thought dictionaries were a bad idea. That you could not condense the meaning of words in a short dictionary definition. That you had to immerse yourself in the subject and look at all the usages of every term, you know, through a thousand years of historical usage. No one was considered <coughs> ready to practice law until he had been studying the law at least 10 years and probably practicing another 10. It was taken that seriously. Now, <coughs> to provide this as a background, then, is to uh, lay the basis for a lot of other things. Because, of course, Constitution.org and the Constitution Society are not just for education or as a reference site. It's also about activism. I'm not just protesting violations of the Constitution. I'm trying to do something about it. This has led to death threats. It's led to lost job opportunities. It's led to all kinds of aggravations. When at the final day of the Constitutional Convention, the delegates, many of them were discouraged at what their work product. They were concerned that it wasn't well enough written, or that people wouldn't accept it, or that it wouldn't work out as they intended. George Washington summed it up in a few words, as he was <coughs> did so well. Let us raise a standard to which the wise and the honest can repair. The event is in the hands of God. In other words, we are not responsible for outcomes. We are responsible only for making our best efforts. And if that leads to misery or death or whatever, so be it. Forget all this nonsense that's taught by some religions in this, that you'll be rewarded in this life if you're good. It's not my experience. In my experience, if you do good, you're gonna get punished. In fact, the more good you do, the chances are the more punished you'll be. You cannot let that be even a thought. You cannot worry about that even for one second. You just keep pushing on. And when I've gotten these death threats, one of them was from an ATF agent, interestingly enough. Passivism is a great philosophy for denizens of the graveyard. I, I don't, I'm not a believer in pacifism. I'm not a believer in starting a fight, but I am a believer in ending one. And if enough people take that attitude, then that will turn the situation around. Because right now, when this country was founded, it was founded by people who got upset when anybody's rights anywhere in the colonies were violated. If one person's rights were violated in Massachusetts, people in Virginia or South Carolina rose up in arms about it. Today we have too many people in this age of bowling alone who say, well, it happened to those other guys. It'll never happen to me. I don't move in those circles. Yes, you do. Any day, even tonight, somebody could come crashing in through your door in black suits and guns, shoot your dog, maybe shoot you, just because they made a mistake about the address that was fingered as the drug, the Jew of being a drug dealer. There was just a case about them, right? And it happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what would it was a liability? Practically not. No. Agents are uh, officially immune. One of the things you'll learn in law, if you haven't already, is immunity. The two different kinds. 
sovereign of a polity and official of officials. So we did the touch that a little bit. Yeah. State Originally, sovereign. the concept was that if an official was operating within his jurisdiction, within his authority, he couldn't be sued or pro uh, prosecuted simply for making a decision within the bounds of his discretion. However, that has been transformed into a blanket immunity against anything he does while he's appointed to that position. When Lon Horiuchi killed Vicki Weaver at Ru Ruby Ridge, he shot her and her, her son was also killed. He was, she was behind the door, it was a blind shot, should never have been taken. The pro public prosecutor, the DA, in that county in Idaho, tried to prosecute him. The case was immediately removed under the re removal jurisdiction clause to federal court and immediately dismissed. Killed for the case. No accountability. Lon Horiuchi was later one of the ones who massacred the Branch Davidians. And if you want to find out more about why that's an issue, if you go to constitution.org, look under abuses, and scroll down to Waco, you can see a link to a complete movie, Waco, A New Revelation, which shows the evidence very clearly that he was murdered. What, what does this have to do with the killing of a Latana for Ben Laden? Anything? Well, that's another sort of a different field. Uh, <coughs> a few years ago, at the Federalist Society, in fact, we had a speaker who was a appointee of the Bush administration to a to the federal bench, and his appointment was being held up. So they parked him in the Justice Department. They put him in charge of international law as it pertains to terrorists. So I uh, said, okay, tell me about letters of mark and reprisal. Because I've never heard of letters of mark and reprisal. Okay, this was the top lawyer in the Justice Department, and he didn't know one of the basic points of law in that field. There are two things that Congress has authority to do for a concerned war. They can issue a declaration of war, and they can issue letters of mark and reprisal. And contrary to what Judge Napolitano mistakenly says on Fox Business News, letters of mark and reprisal are not just for privateers, for private parties. Historically, that's mainly who they were issued to, but in a constitutional system, you either declare war, and a declaration of war has to identify an enemy nation, it has to identify a cause, either a casus belli called a war, or a casus federis, that's an obligation under a treaty. And in doing so, it defines who the enemy is and who it's not. Because in a war situation, everybody has to know who is everybody else's enemy. You have to know who you can trade with, who you can't, who if you trade with, you're gonna, your ships are gonna be subject to search and seizure, and maybe sinking, all right? So these are all ways of clarifying the relationships in a warlike situation. <coughs> Letters from Mark and reprisal are issued to deal with a more limited type of engagement. Generally, they are reprisal for warlike acts. And then generally, they target a particular nation and its assets, and the idea is to exact the same measure of damage to them that they applied to you. So it's supposed to be in proportion. If they sink one of your ships, you sink one of theirs. Not necessarily the same ship. It's under the uh, piece of uh, Think of it in a second. There was a series of peace treaties 
and concluded in 1632, uh, which established the law of nations at that point in time. In effect, every nation is responsible for all the actions of its citizens or anyone operating off their territory. The responsibility is absolute. That, the name I was searching for was Peace of Westphalia. In other words, every nation is a single entity for purposes of the law of nations. Every citizen of a nation is responsible for the acts of every other citizen. Unfortunately, too many of countries today are not really nation states in the Westphalian sense. If you talk to a lot of folks in many of these fairly new countries, it says, oh, we're not responsible for what that tribe over there does. You know, we're, we might be occupied the offices of the central government, but hey, they're, they're, they're doing, they do their own thing. Well, by the West, in the Westphalian sense, they are not accepting their role as a nation state. So, getting back to Osama bin Laden. There is no offense in the Constitution called terrorism. If somebody is charged with terrorism, you're not going to find a provision in the Constitution that authorizes Congress to punish it. Now, there are other provisions under which something like that may be punished. The, the key offenses are piracy and felonies on the high seas and offenses against the laws of nations. In internet, the law of nations, as it existed in 1787, what we call terrorism was piracy. And contrary even to some uh, legal scholars of that era, piracy is not just robbery and sea. That's one form it can take. But piracy generally is a warlike act by a non-state actor against persons or assets of a different country than his own. If it's against his own country, it's treason. So that's the way the typology works out, or is supposed to work out, if you really clearly understand what the Constitution writers were trying to do there. So the actions of Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda are essentially an act of piracy. Piracy is the one kind of offense that is a an exception, in some sense, to the due process protections of the Constitution. At least if they are captured outside U.S. territory. Now, if they are found on U.S. territory, then all the protections of due process apply. But if they're outside U.S. territory, then it's essentially equivalent to a kind of a warlike situation. Uh, pirates are considered enemies of all mankind. And that's an exact quote from legal scholars of that era. In other words, any nation was authorized under the law of nations to kill any pirate anywhere he could find them, with only a rudimentary due process to determine if they're really pirates and which one of a group of people are pirates. Once you've identified this guy, this guy, this guy as a, as a pirate, you can hang him on the spot. And pirates generally were hung on the spot. Captains would conduct the tribunal. They combine, they bring together their officers and says, "Okay, is, was this an act of piracy? Are these pirates? Yep, hang them with the yard arm." You know, this is so so great and weird. About so, do you think Budbiad, Hamdi, and Hamdan were wrong? We just read, you all just read that, right? Mm -hmm. they, yeah. Uh, they were misargued and misdefined. Can you give them a brief, a brief, we, we have spent a lot of time on them. Those were the habeas corpus, the last three habeas corpus cases. You had it too. 
Well, the government kept losing, although not quite fully. Well, habeas corpus uh, is one of the presidency kept losing. Yes. Habeas corpus is one of the few areas of due process that does actually survive in dealing with pirates after outside the United States. Well, there are a category of legal processes called the prerogative writs. Habeas corpus is one, Oberanto is another, in many ways the most important. Certiorari, procedendo, prohibito, and mandamus. Those are the key, the key ones. Scary facias. A writ, a prerogative writ, is not a petition. You'll hear them taught as petitions in the local law school. That is not correct. You will see in federal procedure that one applies for a writ of habeas corpus. That is not correct. A writ is a summons. The person, the demandant, files a writ of habeas corpus, serves it on the respondent, and he is mandated by the mere fact of that filing to respond to it. There is no burden of proof on the demandant. All the burden of proof is on the respondent. And it is supposed to default against the respondent even if no hearing is held. The right involved is the right of the respondent to have the court hold the hearing. If it supports his position, fine. If it doesn't, or if it doesn't hold the hearing, then everyone is supposed to recognize the guy has no authority. Originally, court orders, or the absence of court orders, were enforced by militia. When this country was founded, there were no police as we know them. It was a county judge, a county sheriff, and militia. And juries were considered a specialized form of militia duty. The judge issued an order. The sheriff is likely not the one he would issue it to. He would issue an order, say, okay, citizens, I need you to enforce it, and they would. It's all a matter of custom, of, of practice, of, of established traditions of paying respect to a court order. Everything got done through juries and militia. There are almost no paid public servants. And the system worked remarkably well. Of course, that was also a time when <coughs> A large county was 3,000 people, a large city was 20,000, and there was almost no crime. A few years ago, I went up to New York, went, went through their legal archives from 1776 to about 1804. All the court <coughs> files for the entire state of New York were in one place. We go through them all, one after the other. Almost no crime. A serious crime was drunk and disorderly, or beating your wife. No thefts, no rapes, no robberies, no murders, not, not one murder. The entire time in New York. We live in a different time. So we do need to adapt. But if we were to adapt today, we would have to hold a grand jury and a county officials equivalent for every group of about 3,000 people, which is about a voting precinct. Today in Harris County, a grand jury gets at most 10 minutes to consider a case. So no wonder they start rubber stamping them until a couple of Harris County grand juries decided to go run away and said, wait a minute, we're gonna do a, conduct our own investigations and we're gonna start indicting some judges and some prosecutors and some other people who are misbehaving. A grand jury is not a grand jury unless it's a runaway. They were never intended to be controlled by prosecutors 
and they were never intended to be put out of reach of ordinary citizens to file complaints. Until the late 19th century, almost all public criminal prosecutions were conducted by private parties. A private person would go to the grand jury, as I have with this criminal complaint, grand jury will say, okay, court has jurisdiction, you have sufficient evidence, you may proceed, you are the prosecutor. Now, you can imagine how the landscape would change if today any citizen could go to the grand jury and get authority to criminally prosecute somebody, even a judge, even the, the regular public prosecutor, the cops, anybody. All of a sudden, testifying might become a little less common. So, We have evolved into a situation which is very, very far from that which was envisioned by the framers. And I also need to caution you that if you're going to look to original practice during the framing era for guidance as to the meaning of the terms of the Constitution, you're very likely making a mistake. Because the founders themselves, if they were asked, would probably admit it, that they were establishing ideal standards that they themselves did not live up to. Jefferson and the others knew perfectly well when they said all men are created equal. That that did in fact apply to blacks, and that they were by violating their own precepts. They temporized on that point. They temporized on a lot. They knew perfectly well that their words, their ideals, their legal principles were not congruent to their own practices. But that doesn't mean that their, the meanings that they had for the terms they used are affected by their deviations. It just means that they were human beings in a sticky situation. They didn't feel that they could, at that moment, act according to their own best words and hope that someday people would be able to bring practice into conformity to their own ideals. Hello? Oh. Oh. Okay, close to our time. Welcome back. So, so far, you, we've studied the prize cases. Bill, you covered you know, all the case. Did you hear what he's talking about? For those of you who are good in class, Milligan, the prize cases, and a whole range of things. So, can you give a quick answer to the Hague, to the, to the Boudby and Hamdi thing, and, and to, would you say killing Osama bin Laden was legal? It was legal, however, they did have an obligation to try to take him alive. Even under the piracy notion? Yeah, even under the piracy notion. However, all he had to do was momentarily look like he might be reaching for a trigger of a bomb, and they would be fully justified in blowing him away. Okay, and how about Hamdi, all the habeas corpus that they're giving, and looks like the kind of trials they're, they want, they're gonna give to terrorists? Well, Hamdi and Boumedien are somewhat more complicated. Yeah. The first problem, of course, that you have is holding somebody without charging them. Even pirates have to be charged. You can't just detain someone forever as a material witness. We've even had cases where somebody being detained indefinitely uh, for contempt of court because he didn't produce assets he, that he didn't have to settle a divorce case. Okay, you, there is for every judge, every official, an area of discretion within which he can have a certain amount of latitude. But if the bounds of that discretion are exceeded, it becomes a constitutional violation. Every provision of the Constitution 
as a qualifier. There are no delegation of authority that are plenary within their field, contrary to Justice Marshall and Gibbons v. Ogden. All delegations of authority are for a reasonable public purpose. In the Constitution, for example, uh, delegates a preemptive authority to Congress to regulate the time, place, and manner of congressional elections, except for the place of senatorial elections. Now, under Marshall's opinion in Gibbons, you might, he might say, well, that means that uh, Congress could require uh, uh, the elections be conducted within a one nanosecond time frame on a polling place on the moon, uh, using a ballot that uh, only lists the few approved, few candidates approved by you know, the powers that be. No, it doesn't. The only reasonable public purpose for regulating the time, place, and manner of elections is to make them more convenient, more fair, and more accurate. And if that purpose is not fulfilled, it is not just an abuse of discretion, it is unconstitutional, despite what the words seem to allow. You know about the necessary property? Well, yeah. or even I was just about to go into that. Great minds here. <laughs> Then we're going to give them time to answer, ask some questions. Okay. On my blog, constitutionalism.blogspot.com, I have an article. I also have a uh, have a uh, uh, I think have a, a law review article. Presumption uh, presumption of non-authority and unenumerated rights. Yep. The blog article is entitled "Unnecessary and Improper." And what I show there. I think hopefully convincingly, is that Justice Marshall in McCullough v. Maryland was dead wrong when he appealed to ordinary public meanings of the words of the Constitution. That's wrong because they're not, they were not written in ordinary public English, they are written in legal English. And in legal English, necessary and proper means necessary and proper. It does not mean convenient. And in particular, it means only necessary to make an effort and not to achieve a desired outcome. <coughs> you have a power to regulate, uh, let's say, the labeling of packages. Okay, you can label. But what is the necessary and proper power that's an adjunct to making the effort of regulating the labeling of packages. Well, if you just came to the opinion that the only way you could regulate the labeling of packages was to kill everybody in commerce, that does, mean, that does not mean that it's a necessary and proper power for you to do that. It is only to make an effort. Every delegated power is only to make an effort. If that effort is insufficient for the purpose, too bad. Go back and get more power. You're not allowed to do just whatever it takes to achieve a desired outcome. And once that is made clear, remember, in the necessary and proper clause, it says necessary and proper to carry into what? Effect. Hmm? The power is the effort, it is not the outcome. And we have erected, leading up to the 1942 case of Wickard v. Filburn, a huge array of federal criminal statutes, almost all of which are unconstitutional. By the way, you read U.S. versus Carringer. Yeah. You know, the, uh, yeah. Gambling tax. Yeah. It started out there were no federal criminal statutes under the Commerce Clause, as amplified by the Necessary and Proper Clause, until 1884, when they tacked on a little criminal penalty to transporting tainted meat across a state 
boundary. Right. Right. And upon <coughs> that, and the court allowing them to do it, everything else got built. The original criminal powers were piracy, felonies, Pencils against the law of the nation, treason, counterfeiting. That's it. That's it. Except perhaps for the power to discipline military or militia. Amendments later added to that the powers to forbid enslavement, to uh, protect the rights of citizens of the state against state actors, uh, depriving people of the vote for various reasons. But Nothing in the Constitution authorizes Congress to make it a criminal penalty to fail to pay taxes, to fail to answer a question, to commit fraud, okay, to commit perjury, to do to violate any of the other laws that aren't in that list I gave you. They could be fined monetary fines, could not be thrown in jail, they could not be hung, okay, they could be try have their privileges removed, licenses and such, but that's all. Cong under the Constitution, Congress had only a few limited powers. And what we have seen is constituencies pushing the central government, and for that matter, the state governments, to exercising more and more and more power. And because there's generally a constitu constituency for exercising it, and not enough of a constituency to oppose it, they have achieved a kind of a power creep. Well, I'm going to have to stop right here, because going like, that's U.S. versus Morrison. We bet that. Yeah. Uh, you all remember that. And what else? Lopez? Uh, we talked about we talked a lot about the constituencies, Caroline products, the real story about Caroline products and Milnot, all these constituencies. Well, he he's truly a professional. Uh, I say it's going to be over nine, but we'll he'll stay and talk. Yeah, I can stay as long as you want. But thank you for coming. Uh, I like anybody, any other. I want to make this claim. I don't necessarily agree or disagree with anything he says. <laughs> Sometimes you sound a little bit like Brennan, the living constitution. That gets me a little worried, but I know you don't mean that. Uh, he meant it in a different way. He meant it in a different way. But, you, you, but when you get into the language, uh, the interpretation of not using what we, so I, particularly in, in civil liberties, what the practice was and the argument between Thomas and Scalia and uh, McIntyre. Uh, McIntyre is a case about I believe next semester about um, handbills, not putting your name on handbills. And Scalia and Thomas disagree about what the history tells us about whether you could, you should, the founders would have said it's okay or not okay to put out, this was an attack on a school box. And the woman had put her name on it. And there was a law that said she had to. And Scalia and Thomas, who usually agree on originalism, disagree about what history tells us. And now you're saying, the practice in history we shouldn't even look at. But we'll, we'll come back. John, thank you very, very much. And thank you for the Thank you for ways that we've been thinking, all, and I've been thinking, and I've been talking, we've talked about all semester. Now, by the way, if you use any of these arguments in court, you'll probably get hit with sanctions, <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars. Your case dismissed as frivolous. <laughs> Al's going to want you to go have one final snack before you leave, so you've got to go do it. And let me just ask, those of you who have these wood chairs, if you could bring them back in the dining room, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Are we asking group questions or should we wait? Sure. Oh, you had a couple group questions. Okay. Sure. Uh, do you want to make it necessary to that offer specifically okay. with Gitmo and Osama bin Laden? Was it necessary to offer to kill bin Laden? And going back to the pirates and hanging them, everyone in Gitmo, based on the piracy uh, definition that I, I think I understood, should be hung immediately, right? 
So well, they, they could be, except they are valuable okay. as intelligence sources. And clearly they are because we got information to get a sum. Yeah, by so, the way, a lot of the arguments that uh, uh, what's his name now? Senior moment. Oriental John Yu? Yeah, John Yu, that's it. He and I talked about this, and the same arguments that he made in his memo to the Bush administration are arguments that he got from me. Fortunately, he did not include one that I made to him at the time that is potentially troublesome even to me. There, there is a way to torture people. You try them, you sentence them to death, and they say, okay, we'll defer the execution of the sentence if you want to talk. So they're legally dead, now they can do anything they want to to them. Okay, so that's why in this situation, not hanging them is good because you keep uh, get mode kind of be open to get information from them. Yeah, but the proper legal procedure to take in such a case is to first try them and sentence them to death. Then they always have the option of allowing themselves to be executed to escape the torture. Okay, Brittany, just a second. And John Yu, the holder has been trying to prosecute him for the memo, right? That, yeah, that, which is, of course, is ridiculous. The drink of, that you help, were they going to prosecute you too? Okay, Brittany. A memo is just a memo. Well, I mean, wouldn't that be psychological torture? It would fall under cruel and unusual punishment of saying, kind of holding out this idea that, hey, you could get out of being killed by, you know, by you know, admitting to something, or you could be torturing someone to death and say, yeah, we're going to kill you faster if, you know, you actually tell us what we need to know. That'd be, that would be a cruel and unusual punishment of mode of killing someone, or psychologically um, saying that you won't kill them. And also, you wouldn't be upholding your, you know, your, your statement that you uh, that you send someone to death, you're not killing them, you're just kind of saying, we're, you know, not killing you right now. Because you're, you're, you're actually telling them, well, we're not going to kill you right now if you say something, I guess. Yeah, but I'm saying that logically, that is a way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the, the, the framers of the Constitution did the thing of everything. And also, but, but also, but cruel and unusual wouldn't apply to this. No. Because once you're sentenced to death, no, eighth amendment. Well, I mean, we've had to change our modes of execution because of cool and unusual arguments. Well, that's why you always have to give them the option of accepting death. Still, as long as, as long as they are declining to accept death, then they are voluntarily submitting themselves to torture. And, and also, I kind of had a question about the you were talking about how there was less crime. Um, you know, longer ago, but wasn't less things considered criminal? Like, I, I heard this, this might just be an anecdote, though, that if you shoot someone and you give them a fair warning in their arm, it's not considered murder. And people, you know, so I mean, there could have been more murders, and then also things probably like rape and stuff weren't actually reported. They would either keep in family matters or um, something to a local degree, and it wasn't actually prosecuted. I, would, I kind of would doubt things that we would consider crimes nowadays, a lot of them would actually either go to court, be prosecuted, or anyone would be arraigned, um, awarded justice for it. Well, I grew, I'm grew. i old enough to have grown up in a small town in Texas where there was almost no crime. We didn't have to lock our doors. Any kid could wander all over town. Everybody in town looked after everybody else's kids. The only criminals came from out of town. Well, I come from a small town too, and it—I I, mean—it's—it's it's small, and you know, a lot of people know everyone, and um, you know, it's the same thing. You can leave your car unlocked, you know, if as long as you, like you said, there's no one out of town coming, you you can let your children do whatever they want. But the thing is, behind closed doors, bad things ha can happen in those places, and it's—I and mean, it's—it's it's not likely to be as reported. As like if if like let's say there's a guy who gets drunk and beats his wife or something, it, the whole town knows about it, but they don't do anything because 
that's a socially acceptable thing in that type of community. Yeah, actually, where they would say it's safe. Actually, to also, let there's that her. era. If a guy abused his wife, her relatives and friends would deal with the guy privately. Well, if you have no relatives or family, or, or your family thinks that's the proper way that you should be treated. Well, they generally didn't when I was growing up. <laughs> in fact, there was, there, there was a story about a guy who was called off by his neighbor in the town for abusing his wife. Oh, let's stop, 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 let's finish. I was just going to say goodbye to a couple people that had to leave. He's talking about fe federal offenses. Yeah. You know, these, you know, there may, there was when the federal, when the Constitution was put together. The question was whether what what power they gave to federalize all this, and if there was no crime, that's where I, I think that's what you meant. Right. But States always could prosecute whatever the heck they wanted to. Yeah. But the, I was kind of okay. Hang on. The argument of militia versus yeah. police force too is because militia comes from these families that. Are might not agree on what really is justice. All right, and you can continue this with John. I'm going to just, a couple people have to leave this game late. <laughs> <laughs>